This is the Bad Girls Bible Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Jameson, and this is the place where I interview experts and professionals and everyone in between to teach you how to dramatically improve your relationships and have more enjoyable sex more often. On today's podcast, I'm talking to Elizabeth McGrath, the author of The Couple's Kama Sutra, The Guide to Deepening Your Intimacy with Incredible Sex. And by the way, if you want to learn my most important sex tips and techniques that will bring you and your partner back arching, spine tingling, toe curling orgasms that will keep them coming back for more, you'll find them in my discreet and private newsletter. Just go to badgirlsbible.com slash newsletter, enter your name and email address, and I will send these sex tips straight to your inbox. Elizabeth, thanks so much for coming on the show. Hi, Sean. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Great. So I'd, I'd love to jump straight in and ask you all about, you know, how couples can have better, more enjoyable sex. But first, I'd love to, you know, focus on you and find out a little bit about you and how you came to write this book. It, it was a really interesting uh, kind of roundabout path for me as a professional and a practitioner. I've been a counselor and therapist for going on 12 years now, mm-hmm. but I started my career in a, in a somewhat more conventional way around uh, talking to people um, as a pretty much just uh, standard counseling that people will be familiar with uh, therapy, uh, talk therapy. I practice specifically emotion-focused therapy. So, I so what, what is that exactly, emotion-focused therapy? Yeah, so uh, emotion-focused therapy or EFT really goes in to help people explore uh, their past, various different experiences that they've had, uh, the feelings that were present during those experiences, how their emotions are constructing their perceptions, their perspectives of themselves, of other people. It really goes in to talk about the feelings uh, and how those things are impactful, where those feelings have come from, how they've kind of constructed their belief systems and their understanding of the world uh, around emotions and with emotions as that central focus. And it works really well for a variety of situations. And it's a modality that is pretty frequently practiced these days. And that was a bulk of the training that I received um, early on. I started out as a social worker um, Mm -hmm. and was working with various different communities and then went more toward counseling and then decided that I wanted to go back to school and get my MSW um, and my MA. And as I was doing that, worked really, really hard and um, was working a bunch of different jobs and with different communities and just became pretty burned out Mm -hmm. and decided, okay, I really still want to work with people, but I want to get a bit more physically focused, a little bit less talking. I need some, a bit of a mental break for myself. So I became a trained yoga instructor and alongside my social work career and my counseling career, I had been doing uh, sexual health education and sex ed since I was in my early 20s. And I always felt that it was just sort of a fun kind of side hobby. I loved talking about sex. I loved teaching workshops and educating. Um, I worked at a sex toy retailer in the Bay Area called Good Vibrations, which I loved. Mm -hmm. But I always felt like that was, yeah, great, great stuff there. Great organization. And I always felt that that was just sort of something I was indulging in for my own interests because I was really passionate about it. But as I began to study yoga and kind of look at the what are my next steps thing, um, I had a friend in conversation say, you know, you do all these things and you think they're unrelated, but what if you were to try and put them all together? Okay. And I thought to, I thought to myself, how in the world would I do that? You know, and and not to go off on a tangent, in the U.S., really there are very, very few actual programs to become a sex educator or to become, um, you know, a sex therapist or really focus in on that. And so I find that like myself, a lot of people are sort of cobbling together different things and getting training where we can and kind of creating our own path. So that was really my story as well, that I, um, I went back and did a year of training um, in a couple different modalities one, which is somatica, uh, that focuses on somatic sexuality, coaching and therapy. So what what would somatic coaching be for those listening? Yeah. So somatics is really in its most literal form. It means of the body and somatics believes that all the things that we think and feel really, we think about them mentally, 
but mm-hmm. they come from our bodies. They have a physical impact. There is a very physical component to that. You hear very often that idea of sort of mind-body connection, mm. um, how the things that we think impact us physically and vice versa. And somatics really posits, okay, we can talk about your feelings, we can talk about traumas, we can talk about your beliefs, we can talk about all these things. But when it comes to how you're living and what's happening for you, your body is a really important part of that. And it's a really, really important part of that for sex, right? Sex Mm, is really our body. And I'll get into that um, probably definitely more later, but you know, my belief is that we spend way too much time in our heads about sex and not enough time in our bodies. So I think that, that makes perfect sense. You know, a lot of yeah. people, they either build it up too much or they don't kind of, you know, or they get anxious about it instead of um, just listening to their body. Totally. And yeah, that's, I think, really at the root of somatics and why it became a practice. So I also studied a method that's called Hakomi, and that really gets into just how often the body is ignored as part of our experience that we, you know, think, oh, okay, yeah, our body's just kind of following along with what we think and what we feel rather than looking at it as a complete system that needs acknowledgement, needs attention and care in, on every level. Mm. So I think for me, starting to practice yoga gave me a sense of mindfulness and how important embodiment was. And how important it was to feel sensations, actually really live in and inhabit our bodies. Mm-hmm. And so that that motivated me to practice somatically, to really work with people, to help them have a physical component to how they understand themselves and their lives and their sexuality and their connection with other people. So I was practicing for a few years and I was approached by a publisher when actually I was in India. Um, oh, cool. Traveling, uh, studying, looking at aspects of the Kama Sutra, looking at sexuality in India. And I was approached by this publisher, um, Callisto Media, who's fantastic. And they said, you know, we're really wanting to create something for couples and for people who are exploring uh, sexual relationships with others that takes some of the basic Kama Sutra stuff that's out there, but really takes it to the next level. We want the positions, but we also want the skills and the things that people can utilize to not just put their bodies in different positions, but actually have a really radically different sex life. And what would you think about, you know, writing that and and making that happen? And at the time it was, it was kind of crazy. It was kind of crazy for me, um, you know, thinking, Oh wow. Okay. Could I do this? And what does that look like? But what was really awesome about it was that, what they were approaching me with was something I already felt really strongly about, um, that you can try new things, you can um, spice it up, you can be adventurous. But if the basic building blocks of embodiment and connection and presence and communication of desire and really feeling good about what you want and really in your body, um, it makes those things hard to enjoy. It's kind of, um, you know, putting a cherry on top of a sundae that's already melted a bit. You know, you mm. want to build up the really good foundation. That's a really good component. analogy. Thank you. And, and then put cherries on top. And then the whole thing will be delicious, not just, oh, well, okay, this is, this is kind of fine and we're trying these fun things, but we don't really have the delicious basics that we need. So that was really why I thought, hey, this could be utilized and I think people would really get a lot out of it. I completely understand. That that makes perfect sense. I mean, if you're already doing it, why not write a book? You know, help more than just, you know, one-on-one kind of session. You can help a lot more people at the for same sure. time. So, so what is Kama Sutra exactly? You know, for those listening, I mean, everyone I think has heard of it, but mm-hmm. there's a whole lot of, I suppose, maybe maybe misinformation or just like misunderstanding, but what is Kama Sutra? Or that Kama well, so, Sutra. Yeah. So the Kama Sutra um, is actually an ancient Indian text. Uh, it's the oldest textbook of erotic love, uh, and it dates back more than 2,000 years. And 
the Kama Sutra is still highly relevant to modern life, but we don't often consider that it's this really uh, foundational ancient text that really has nothing to do with the Western world. Um, it, its exposure in the West began during what what we still consider sort of the sexual revolution in the U.S. in uh, the mm-hmm. 1960s and 70s. And it was brought back by individuals who were studying in India, who were starting to be proponents of yoga and various different types of movement. Um, and I think it's really become synonymous with sex positions and mm. exploring sexual positions. But actually, the sutras um, are aspects of Indian cultural life. So talking about how to live, how to clean oneself, how to interact, how to be socially strong. I mean, it's the sutras cover really just about anything that you can think of. Um, let's see, some of them, um, things having to do with partners and with dating, uh, finding a partner, power in marriage, adultery, uh, drug use, spiritual possibilities, different kinds of relationships, seduction, uh, sexual and relational role reversal. Wow. Um, so what you're so saying, well, what you're saying is maybe the Indians had figured out self-help 2000 years before, before it reached <laughs> America. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, with, as with any interpreting any text, there's a lot of it that is not prescriptive for modern life now, right? It's written in a context that I would say is it would could be looked at as much more misogynistic, you know, far less feminist inclined. There's okay. a lot of it that doesn't necessarily work for modern times. But I think the the part that I always want to get across to people is that it is not just a book of positions and how to you know, do these things sexually. It was really written in its entirety to be a manual for life. Mm. And we, we've adopted the pieces of it that I think are most interesting and most titillating, but in, in a whole context of, Hey, let's look at your whole life and really how you are present in it. It offers us some things that I think we haven't really previously used it for. So let's, let's say a couple's listening. Um, (laughs) and they want, they want to, you know, maybe maybe their sex lives become a bit routine and they want to spice it up sure. or maybe just straight up increase the pleasure of the sex they're already having. Where mm-hmm. where would you start with those, with a couple like that? If if, if they came to you, um, that er- everything in their relationship was maybe fine, you know, everything was okay. pretty good, but okay. but it wasn't, it just wasn't that exciting, wasn't that pleasurable. Wh- where would you start? I think I would begin with helping them to look at what they are getting out of their sexual experience. You know, if they're feeling connected and really present and they maybe just need to try some new things. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yeah. You know, we both are enjoying each other. Uh, We feel like we're having, you know, the orgasms we want. We're able to really be touched in the ways that we want. Um, The communication is good. So I know what I want and I'm able to share that and ask for that. I feel like, you know, he or she is the same way with me. If, if it feels like sort of the basic building blocks are there, mm-hmm. then a really great way to move from that place is to say, okay, well, what are you both curious about? What do your fantasies generally look like? What are the things that you find yourself uh, masturbating to? What are some images that are titillating for you? Um, in, in the sort of basics of the roles that you play in your relationship, are there ways that you're interested in kind of you know, moving back and forth with that, switching up the power dynamic. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's look a bit at the things that you enjoy feeling um, on your body and in your body. You know, do you like slower sensations? Do you like it a little bit faster? Are you interested in size? Do you like warmth? What are some of the sensations that your body most enjoys? And then let's look at toys and experiences and things that can kind of build on that that feel new and exciting. Mm. I mean, really, when it comes to sex, the possibilities are, are really genuinely, genuinely uh, endless. And I, I couldn't that agree that more. Be, and sometimes yeah. they don't seem endless because couples are afraid to talk to each other about these things. They don't actually have the conversation, you know? Sure. Yeah. Or because the things that you know, occur to a person or seem interesting, you know, society has said, oh, that's weird or that's strange or that's too much or, you know, you're going to be judged for that. But I think when we have a space that is safe and connected and also self-accepting to really look at without boundaries what turns us on, 
it may not be the full fantasy. It may not be the actual um, experience itself, but there's always elements of that to explore. Mm -hmm. So for instance, it's a, it's a pretty controversial one, but one of the most common fantasies for women in the U S is a rape fantasy. And I think so often I work with clients who are really quite put off by that because the idea is, Oh, well, I, I shouldn't fantasize about that. That's socially inappropriate. That's ethically problematic and morally wrong. It means something about me. Um, if I was to communicate that, I would be judged. Um, obviously, I don't want that to happen in real life. So it's a very black and white thing. The fact that I'm fantasizing about this is really problematic. And what I do with people is I say, wait a minute. Okay, we know we know you don't want that to happen. We know that there are a lot of elements of that that are really unsafe. And if we judge it in a social context, of course, there's a lot about that that's going to feel challenging to you. But let's bring it down to the felt pieces of it. What about that is actually a turn on for you? Is it being out of power? Is it being controlled? Is it feeling a certain level of desire? Let's get down into the actually more felt, again, somatic experiential elements of it. And see what we can play with there, right? Because, yeah, the, the full thing is not is not going to work for you in a variety of ways. But how would it feel to have your partner grab you more often? Hmm. How would it feel to be blindfolded? How would it feel to get a text message that said, you're out of control for the rest of the night and I'm deciding what's happening? You know, here's where you're going to go. Here's what you're going to do. Beyond that, don't ask any questions. This is what's going to occur. How does it bring up feelings of, you know, desire, consent, communication, negotiation? All of that stuff can be looked at, and that's really where the possibilities lie. When when you actually allow the body and the mind space to explore, mm -hmm. then so much is possible. But when we say, no, 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 I can't have that, or that's bad, or that's wrong, or that's devious, or that means something about me, then the, then the possibilities definitely shrink. And also that's where things like shame come in. You know, that we feel we spend so much of our lives feeling ashamed about what we want and what turns us on. And it's it's crazy as well if there's two consenting adults that aren't mm -hmm. hurting each other and mm -hmm. that aren't doing anything illegal, th there really shouldn't be a problem, you know? Yeah. But but again, I think we really live in a world that says, you know, that, that logically it, it could be that simple and and in most cases i think should be that simple but so much of what we've come to believe and understand and know about ourselves is really in this very socialized context that is very sexually limited you know i, I think that most often whether i mean the funny thing about it is that we're bombarded by sexual images all day long Right. And so oh, it feels sure. like, especially in the Western world, oh, sex all the time and, you know, bodies on billboards and television commercials and how women are supposed to look and how men are supposed to look. But ultimately, we're, we're bombarded by all these ideas without a lot of space for conversation. And the conversation is where we accept each other. We feel seen. We feel supported. Um, we have those conversations of, oh, you like that? I like that, too. Yeah, I want that. When the conversations aren't happening, when we're not allowed to be as we are and who we are, whether or not it makes logical sense to be able to just openly do it with our partner, we don't know how. And we don't have that practice. And it's not something that feels safe. And really, it's this incremental process of, you know, trying it, putting yourself out there, mm -hmm. sharing that thing, being met by a person, being met by your partner. Oh, yeah, I hear that. That sounds fun. I want to do that too. That's great. And then trying it again. And again and again, but doing that is really can feel for people like stepping out onto a ledge mm. and a really scary thing. And then unfortunately, if, if anybody, and I feel like most of us have, if anybody has a circumstance where they do put themselves out there and they are judged or they aren't met or they're shamed, then it feels even harder to do it the next time. You're absolutely and, right. It's, yeah. it, it can be one of the toughest things and it can make someone who's built up maybe over weeks waiting to tell their spouse or their partner, you know, I have this thing and they, they finally built up the courage to say it. And then they're shot mm -hmm. down in five seconds. And I see that so, so often. And I think that a good, maybe 70% of the couples that I work with are somewhere in that pattern with each other where they've either been shot down. And so they're not 
feeling safe to communicate or they're worried about what they want to communicate or they've been shot down in other relationships or had their wants and needs judged. And so really they're in a very tender place of just practicing, this is what I want. This Mm -hmm. is who I am. This is what I want. And it seems so simple, but it's really difficult to do for a lot of reasons and in a lot of circumstances. And that's, that's part of really the fundamental work of having great sex is being able to articulate what we want and need, not without shame, but pushing through shame, pushing through worry to get to the other side and actually get so, those things met. So maybe you're saying you feel the, you feel the fear and do it anyway as the, I think there's a book with that title. Yes. But, that you, yes. <laughs> but, but that it, it's sort of like, um, you know, that, you know, brave, courageous people do feel fear as well. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're not just like perfectly confident that maybe, you know, people sh- should embrace that and just understand that it might be, you know, a, a little bit awkward. They might feel very nervous, but as long as they're with a partner who's open to them, and mm-hmm. who's communicative, communicative. Mm-hmm. Sorry, my Irish accent is so bad for yeah. long words. <laughs> no, that's good. Uh, you know, but that it can, um, it can be a whole lot, e- not easier in the short term, but a lot easier in the long term to get exactly what, what you want. Definitely. And I think that that's the other piece too, is oftentimes people are in relationships where they, they feel like their partner's open, but they don't necessarily know yet, or they haven't tested that. And I think that the worst case scenario feels like, okay, so if I ask for this thing and then I'm shamed around it or my partner's judging me, well, then what? You know, then then I have these bigger questions of, can I get my needs met here? Do I ask again? Is this the right person for me? Is this relationship progressing? And And so I think that it's both fear and then avoidance of hard questions and avoidance of hard circumstances. And I, and I really do get that and understand that. But I do think that, you know, I don't know if this is in relationship to the book that you just mentioned either, but it's a great saying that everything we want is on the other side of fear. Mm. And, and I think that when we allow ourselves more space to contact the really scary thing, then we have a better chance of really getting to all we want to do and feel and try. And it's never as simple as, okay, your partner doesn't want this to that relationship's over, but it might be as simple as when you start to take up space for the things you want, you start to understand more of what you deserve in a relationship and start to bring toward you people who want that too. And make space for, yeah, no, I, I don't have to compromise myself in order to be loved and be accepted. I can feel good about what I want and I can say, okay, if this person ultimately doesn't want that too, that's okay. That means we're maybe not a fit or that means that sexually we need to explore in different ways or, you know, look to what else is possible for us. So I, I suppose you've, you've covered a lot there. So besides avoidance because of fear maybe shame Mm -hmm. and that causes Mm -hmm. avoidance as well bad communication what what would you say are the other things that are common that couples both men and women might might experience that prevents them from having better sex i I see a lot of what i would call gendered expectations and i see a lot of people um really working to combat those and very, you know, chafing really hard against the edges of those. So I'll give you some basics. Um, men are meant to be aggressive. They're meant to want sex all the time. Women are more emotionally focused and have lower libidos. Um, sex is really about the orgasm. And it is more of the man's responsibility to give the woman an orgasm. If he can't, if she doesn't orgasm, it means he's doing something wrong. It means there's problems there. If a woman takes a long time to orgasm, it means that she is not turned on enough. Um, if there's not relatively immediate wetness and vaginal lubrication that is related to her turn on, um, you know, men do want sex all the time. So oftentimes I see couples where, you know, it's like, okay, he wants to have sex all the time, but I'm really tired and I feel like I'm only good for sex for him and I don't know what to do about that. So really these expectations that have to do a lot with gender roles in relationship. And again, so much of that comes from how we're socialized, what we learn as young people, as teenagers, what's perpetuated in conversation, things like that. 
And, you know, the reason why I mention that is that I always really want to work with people to move beyond that. Um, I do agree with a lot of research that's been done that looks at physiology and hormonal aspects in men and women. And really, I do give credence to the fact that physiologically, uh, our bodies are different. There are various different things that we could consider as averages. But for a person to say, this is how I'm supposed to work. This is how my body's supposed to work. This is how I'm supposed to be or should be in a relationship. Those ideas are really limiting and, again, can really can really impact how people relate to each other. Um, you know, if I'm a man and I'm supposed to want sex all the time and I'm supposed to be giving my wife orgasms and that's not happening over and over again, not only does that feel a certain way in relationship to my partner, that makes me feel a certain relationship to my masculinity, and to being a good man and to being a satisfying partner and those conceptual, you know, gender role aspects can be really insidiously degrading for people, you know, okay, so this is hard for my relationship, but now my identity is compromised. I'm mm. not a good blank. I'm not a satisfying blank. I'm not a successful blank, you know, husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner. Um, and, and those things really tear people down over the long term. And I think those are the kinds of things that people actually carry from relationship to relationship so, and become, you know, the triggering things that they need to work through and kind of get past to connect. So what would be maybe some solutions to that? Because I, I can see exactly what you're talking about. It exists. Mm -hmm. It exists in every aspect of life, but just yeah. for your sex life, how, what can couples do to help shed these gendered expectations? Yeah. So again, it's really about bringing it from the mental, from our perceptions and our ideas and what I like to call the mental chatter. So the, you're not good enough. You're not a good blank. You're not doing this right. You're not satisfying all of those sort of that chatter, those mental tapes that to be really clear are never positive. They're always negative. Right. Um, we notice about our minds that most of the time when we feel stuck in analysis or spinning out, our minds are not saying lovely, positive, flowery, sunshiny things to us. They're saying, you know, you're Too wretched true. and you're not you're not enough and you should be and all of that stuff. It's really about bringing it from that level to the physically felt level. You know, again, for taking the um, example of a, of a man and his sexual libido and his want just talking to him, you know, how often do you want sex? What does that feel like? How do you notice that in your body? What is that, you know, what's going on for you when you feel desire? What stimulates and sparks desire for you? Oh, well, I actually feel like I'm sparked by desire when, you know, we're cuddling, but that's not very manly and I'm really, I don't feel good about that. I, I feel like I should be turned on by blank. Okay, great. You're noticing all of the things you think. You're noticing all of the shoulds and supposed tos. Let's go back to just that piece of cuddling, right? What does that do for your body? Do you feel safe? Do you feel present? What are the sensations that are there? How can we have more of that for you? How can you practice more of that, explore more of that, and really stay at that level and move away from some of this judgment and some of these ideas and activate around physically in the present moment what's working for you. Mm. And it's really just a change of focus. It's really, again, about moving from all these ideas and perceptions, some of the more negative, I, you know, mind junk into where's your body really at? And I do that work with women uh, around orgasm all the time. I see quite a lot of women that have maybe never had an orgasm or have difficulty achieving orgasm. And the first thing I say to you is, hey, let's work through some of the stuff about how often you're supposed to come. Let's talk about freeing you from the idea that you have to have an orgasm every time where there's something wrong with you. Let's move away from the idea that orgasm is what dictates whether sex is successful or not. Let's talk about all the other things that feel great for you. You know, do you, do you like being touched slowly? Do you enjoy the intimacy? Do you enjoy the connection? What if sex could be about all these things that you enjoy without you having to feel bad about your orgasm? What would that look like? You know, how would that free you from shame? And how could that deepen your exploration of everything else that's there for you and what your body really loves about sex? Hmm. Yeah, I, like I really love your answer. It's, um, it's not super simple 
like I suppose like a lot of things that that really matter in your life. But if people are if people are interested and they genuinely want to get past these things, they they need to kind of do exactly what you said. And and the way that I work on that with people to give you really sort of the more step by step what that looks like um, to take it from conceptual to actual is I utilize a, a really simple and basic practice of body awareness to give people a much more connected, rooted experience of physicality. So the primary way that I do that with people is through the breath, through helping them connect back to their sensations. So for for people listening right now, uh, it's very likely that you're either you know in a car or you're taking a walk or you're sitting somewhere. So just for a moment as you're listening to this, um, you're hearing the sound of my voice, you're processing my words, your brain is really integrating all of this and taking it in. But just for a moment, feel your butt, wherever your butt is sitting on a chair, in your car, walking you down the street. And as I say that, you're able to feel the muscles of your butt, whatever it's touching, being supported by something underneath you. That physical awareness, that sensate focus, it's always there. All I've done is draw your attention to it. Our bodies, what we feel, what's happening for us physically is always present. The only difference between feeling it all the time and not is where we have our focus, right? Are we in our minds? Are we in our analysis? Are we thinking about the next day? Are we planning our grocery list? Are we worrying about the future? Or are you actually sitting for a moment, feeling your feet on the floor, feeling your breath in your lungs, taking a moment to inhabit your body, right? The sensation's always there, but how often do we inhabit it? So that's really the grounded work that I do with people is let's practice inhabiting your body. And next time you're having sex and you start to go to that place, oh, it's been a half an hour. I'm supposed to come now. It's been taking too long. Bring it back. Bring it back to what you feel. You know, what are you feeling? What are you feeling in your pussy? What are you feeling in your butt? You know, where are your hands? What is your breath doing? What feels good about this? Could something feel better? Do you want to move a different way? Do you want to shift? Do you want to connect with your partner a different way? All of those, oh, it's been too long. I should, I need to. He's thinking, I'm thinking. That's all in your brain. In your body, there's a lot of delicious stuff going on and a lot of great information. That's all you need. You don't need the mental chatter. It does not serve you or add to your physical experience in any way. And most often it takes you away from that physical experience. So again, that's that's how I work with people to practice is basics like, you know, having you feel your butt right now over and over and over again, feel your sensations in your body and habit that. And then it becomes like second nature. Um, and incidentally, our bodies are built for that purpose. We do not, as young children, start out in our minds. If you spend uh, time in the company of, of a toddler, you know, one to two years old, you'll notice that they... They cry, they grab, they hug, they scream, they laugh, they run. They are these, you know, small creatures of really pure animal existence because they haven't lived long enough and had the practice of analysis and processing and brain. They live in their bodies. Mm -hmm. And we start out this way. We are meant for this. Our bodies are built for pleasure. So all I really do with people is take them back into that back into you have this body let's just hang out there right let's pay attention to that that's where all the good sexual information and experience and delicious stuff is a little bit less mind a lot more body i love it i have to say when you said but uh at mm-hmm. the start i was like oh <laughs> you know there's there's going to be someone listening maybe and it's like <laughs> oh wow it really grabs their attention yeah, because, you know, and I, I usually use butt instead of, you know, feet or thighs or something else is because most often it's a part of our body that's it's generally engaged with something, right? We're usually sitting or walking. And, and again, how often do you, how often do you feel your chair underneath you? How often do you feel your car seat underneath you? I mean, most often we get in our car, we drive to the next place and we kind of forget how we got there because we're in our office or we're at dinner or we're at the grocery store. We're not actually in our car, in our seat, feeling that presence. We're in our mind somewhere else. And really wherever your mind is, if you are in, if you are thinking, if you are in that, you're there. You're not present to where your body is. You know, when you come back to, oh, my body is in the bed. Oh, that's, 
what his hands feel like. Oh, that's the temperature of the room. Oh, I'm noticing that I'm breathing faster. Then immediately you're there. You're there in the room. You're there in your body. You're there to access all the pleasure, you know, but when you're thinking about, you know, your kid's recital the next week, you're at your kid's recital as opposed to being present in the room. And, and again, it's not a wholly bad thing, but it does compromise just all the great stuff you can get out of sex, right? It just, it, it takes away from the possibilities of the experience for you. Um, it, to some extent, can, yeah, I, I, will, I guess I won't say cheapen, but, but really compromise everything that you want. You know, and people are, say to me, oh, I want more and I want deeper. And they describe that the best sexual experiences they've had are ones where, oh, I wasn't even thinking. It was just so raw. And, you know, that, we were that just is such crazy. a good point. Like, that's, I think that's the perfect way to sum it up. Yeah. You know, it's, and it's, it's sort of like you said, it's, you said, you said it previously, it's acting with kind of just animalistic intention. Like lots of people, lots of emails I get you know, women have said to me that the best sex they ever had, it was like animalistic yeah, because it was, you know, raw and just, they let their, I suppose they let their body take over. Exactly. And I'm, I'm very fond of referring to our body as the animal and our brain as the machine. And when we disengage from the machine and let the animal take over again, what's so great about that and why it's the best sex we've ever had is that's where all the good stuff is. You know, the good stuff is, is from our, our neck down. The things that compromise what feels good are really from, you know, our noses up. Mm. And when we just are able to unleash and be present for whatever reason, um, you know, sometimes it can be, you know, we've had a drink or two or we feel more relaxed or with a partner that demands that kind of attention or there's less of the social constructions, you know, in play. We're not as worried. We're not as stressed out. Whatever the reasons are when we find ourselves in those moments, we come away from that feeling so satisfied because that's what our body wants. Our body wants all the attention. Mm. You know, our, our body is always saying, Hey, pay attention to me, but our brains are really strong and our brains are really good at saying, Nope, I'm, I'm going to keep, I'm keeping the microphone. I'm keeping the spotlight body. You can, you can, you know, <laughs> and they're, they're so there. good at coming I'm up sure. with something very specific as well. Like don't forget about tax season. It's on its yeah. way. Oh, which is and great, it's, right? Oh, it's the it's the worst. And again, the things that our brain thinks are oftentimes challenging, worrisome, fearful, downright mean. And if you think just for a moment of just standing in a room all by yourself and someone coming up and just putting their hand on your chest, not saying anything, but just a hand on your chest and just standing with you for a moment and then walking away, how that would feel. And then come to someone coming up and saying to you, hey, don't forget about your taxes and how that would feel. And what do those things do to your body? One is a, oh, hi, there's a sensation. We're here. Okay, bye. The other is, I, oh, yeah, that's just making <laughs> You ruined my day. <laughs> right? Your body contracts. It shuts down. It pulls away from that person. It says, oh, geez, you immediately go up into your mind. That, that is what's happening when we are spending time and allowing, you know, those mean voices, spending time with those mean voices and, and all the stuff our mind says. It's very difficult to be sexually present and juicy and feel really good when we're in the company of, you know, more or less people saying mean things to us <laughs> and being critical. You know, no one would, would want to spend time with that person at a party, but we spend a whole lot of time with that person in a bedroom. Yeah, it's, and it, you know, it's crazy. And it's just, yeah, it's just less necessary and less immediately. It's less necessary that it happen the way we think it just happens. You know, it does not have to be that way at all. So I'd love to move on to positions. Um, yeah. Because I know, I know the book is, uh, you know, it's not just about, you know, sex positions, but they are an important part of good sex. So definitely. <clears throat> I'm just wondering if there's a couple listening and maybe, maybe the, the female partner, you know, enjoys a lot of clitoral stimulation. Um, what kind of positions could she be using maybe besides missionary position to enjoy more, more stimulation on her clit? 
Yeah, so I really like um, use a lot of the positions in the book that focus on body contact, but allow for either, you know, the woman's hands <clears throat> or her partner's hands to be within reach to actually provide that clitoral stimulation. So I think missionary can be a great one, but oftentimes people in missionary are really focused on sort of holding their bodies or getting that closeness, and it can feel like there's a little bit less space mm. for clitoral stimulation. Um there's a position in the book that I, I call it the sexy back and it's really um, so the giving partner, the partner who's penetrating would be lying on their side and then the receiving partner um, would have their head down around their knees with their back to, to their, their thighs and their butt. And so then penetration comes in from behind, but what it does is because, you know, she's on her side and he's on his side, there's just this really great arm reach where, you know, he or she can get in between her thighs and sort of gently stroke or she can grind on the hands. So getting penetration from behind, but also all of this access in the front. So it's a, really is, is this, a, would it be a little bit like spooning, but with the, <laughs> with the female partner kind of more curled up? A little bit more curled up, but the heads, uh, each person's head is on opposite sides. So with spoons, both people are in the same physical position and then actually, um, you know, back to front. Mm. So this would be back to front, but one person's head would be on the opposite side from the other. So, so the person in front, their back would be against their partner's thighs rather than against their partner's chest. Ah, and okay. Back, if that makes sense. Yeah, so the penetration is still coming from behind, but it allows for really great body curling. And then again, if you're thinking about it, if her if her butt is you know getting penetration from behind, either vaginally or anally, and being cradled by like thighs, then his hand or her hand from up above is basically right there to reach in between the legs. Absolutely, and so many people forget about that. They think. There's like a rule book for sex and when you're having sex, you're not supposed to use your hands because that was for foreplay and it's perfectly totally. fine. Like if, if you're not getting enough, you know, stimulation on your clit, you know, it's, it's absolutely fine for either of you to be providing that with your hands. Yeah. And I cannot tell you how many women feel like if they rub themselves during sex, that it, they think it means their partner's not doing a good job oh, or they're worried about offending their partner or they think, oh, if I, if I touch myself, he's going to think I'm not turned on enough or he's going to think that, you know, his penis isn't enough or what we're doing isn't enough. And I really always like to, you know, disabuse just about everybody from the idea that vaginal orgasm a is the best way to come and B is often going to result in an orgasm. Uh, the vaginal canal has very, very few nerve endings, whereas the clitoris has multiple thousands. Hmm. And, and I mean, if we think about it, you know, based on physiology and evolutionary purpose, it does not make sense for the vaginal canal to have a lot of nerve endings. Babies come out of there. Mm. It can be a lot of physical pain, things like menstruation, right? So when you think about just penetration, there's just less stimulation there. And that has absolutely nothing to do with what a good job someone's doing, you know, how someone is penetrating. There are great things going on inside the vagina like the G-spot. But mm -hmm. that, that being stimulated oftentimes is really great with fingers because fingertips can feel it and get a specific angle and mm. really press on it. Um, it is completely possible in penetration with a penis or a dildo. But that can be a little bit harder to find. Um, also, so, some women but if let's it. let's say you know what you said, I'm going to give it. A, I'm going to. It sounds like a challenge. I'm going to try it sure. anyway. What 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 kind of positions are good? Not using your hands, but for for vaginal sex. What positions are good for you know putting pressure on the G spot, massaging the G spot? So in in most in most bodies. Um, bodies that have G-spots and, and vaginas and vaginal canals. Um, it's generally, so for the person whose G-spot it is, you'd want to look at your first finger into your knuckle. So that depth on your body. So your, your partner may have bigger hands or longer fingers. So you'd want to gauge based on the first knuckle of your first finger. Mm -hmm. So just inside the vaginal canal to that depth generally um, up toward the belly button. So if the woman um, is on her belly, it would be down with a little bit of curvature down. If she's on her back, it would be curvature up. So you're going to think about the finger curving in the direction of the belly button to find it. And what you're looking for is generally somewhere between a dime or to a little bit larger than a quarter sized 
area of spongy tissue that can feel like a ruffled potato chip, like a ridged mm. potato chip. I've and heard it described as a wet <laughs> raspberry as well. Yeah, yeah. So you're just looking for a little bit of different texture. So most of the time, the walls of the vaginal canal are relatively smooth and muscular, but the G-spot is going to feel spongier and like it's definitely got more of a different texture, more texture to it. And so when you find that, what you're looking to do is really sort of like gently stroke your finger across it, gently press on it. You want to begin really slowly either on yourself or with a partner doing this or doing this to your partner. And you want to just give it a little bit of time and move slowly and say, you know, okay, is that good? A little bit deeper, a little bit harder, et cetera. And when you find it, then you have a generally good idea of where it is. In positions, what we're looking for, again, with a penis, with a dildo, with any kind of uh, insertion, penetration, is just that angle, that upward angle toward the belly button, that downward angle toward the belly button, depending on where you are. Now, all penises are different. You know, they curve all different delightful directions. They go up and down, etc. So working with your own physiology, what you're just attempting to do is either is get your hips in relationship to your partner's vaginal opening so that you have a pretty good upward angle. And that's going to be different for everybody. So working with pieces of furniture, propping up with pillows, um, working, you know, off the side of a bed, getting your partner to tilt their hips up. Um, There's a position in the book that I call the G hunter. And what it is, is so um, it's the giving partner, (coughs) excuse me, they're up on their knees. So upright on their knees, not sitting down on their knees. And then the receiving partner is lying on their back but has their butt tilted upward and their legs bent with their feet resting on their partner's chest. So the back is tilted upward. You know, the butt, the vagina is in contact straight on with their partner's, you know, partner's penis or whatever they're working with. And then the legs are gently curled with the feet. And, and the feet pressing on the chest is a really important component because it allows the receiving partner to move in relationship to it to get whatever angle feels best for them. And then what they can do is the giving partner can lower to get more of a pelvic tilt. They can go higher, really whatever that angle needs to be. Um, Oftentimes positions can be a little challenging because there's height differences uh, between men and women or between different partners. So just working with really the length of your femurs, how tall you are, all the things you need, um, you're just going to move your body around. And when it comes to trying new positions, I tell people, keep it experimental Absolutely. There's, I think there's nothing more important than that, that there's no, like I said previously, there's no law for having, you know, for having sex, obviously, as long as it's legal uh, in your in your country. But like what, what you and your partner do, it needs to be, you know, like spiced up a little bit, changed up just so, you know, you might find a certain angle, a certain spot that your man's mm-hmm. hitting. And stay in it, stay in it for a little while. Hang out there. You know, I have I have clients say, "Oh, well, I tried that position; it didn't really work." And the first thing I'll ask them is, "How long did you try it?" Right? Not, "Oh, we tried to put ourselves in it and then thrust, and it didn't feel good." But did you move it around a little bit? Did you stay there and kind of settle into it to see how it felt, and then change something else? You know, did you get some pillows and put them under your pelvis? Did you try it on a different piece of furniture? Really explore all the possibilities of the position, and really, if absolutely nothing about it feels good then move on. But my thought about each of the positions is that if you give yourself enough time to move through it and try it, there's going to be something that feels great about just about every one of them. So what about then maybe the female partner wants slightly deeper penetration? It it sounds from what you're saying that actually that the G the G hunter, I think you said? Yes, correct. Perhaps that that could even be modified for deeper penetration. But say, but Definitely. say, say, say someone's looking for deeper penetration. What, what would you recommend? So it's, it's actually a really easily modified position. And what, what the receiving partner would do is they would just bring their feet off of their partner's chest and they would bring, they would bring their knees back by their shoulders hmm. and the partner on top would come off their knees and basically lean over their partner. And I, I call this one, the fold. And this is actually a position, um, from the Kama Sutra called Uthkanta. And it's a very, very popular Kama Sutra position. And it's because it does allow such deep penetration. It is really like groin on groin, pelvis to pelvis connection. So just picturing, you know, the female partner, the receiving partner on their back, Mm -hmm. fully folded, 
uh, knees as close to shoulders as is possible. Feet are up in the air and then the giving partner is on top leaning over. They're up on their arms or gently leaning down if the pressure is okay. And, and it's really completely open and very, very connective really a lot of, of penetrative opportunity and then great chances to go as deep or as shallow as you want or to kind of play with it, move around a little bit, all those things. Um, another great one that can be modified from uh, G Hunter is keeping the giving partner up on their knees, just okay. having the receiving partner take their feet off, lower their pelvis down to the bed and have their legs up on a V on either side of their partner's head. So straight legs, V up on the shoulders, you know, one foot on one side of their partner's head, one foot on the other side, but their body's much more relaxed and it allows their partner to lower down, to lean over and to get penetration that again is really pelvis to pelvis Mm. and explore depth that way. And maybe, maybe just requires a little bit of flexibility. Mm -hmm. And and that one um, is a little bit, the folds can be really a bit more flexy. Um, It's really how bendable you are at your middle in your hip flexors, uh, down in your quads and your thighs. But the V-force is really, um, you know, the partner down on their back with their legs just extended straight up. And then the giving partner just comes in and allows those legs to rest on either side of the head. So that one doesn't need too much flexibility. So what about then... Um, and I guess this is the last one is if maybe uh, the female partner wants her man to kind of feel bigger inside him, inside her, is there anything mm-hmm. she can do to kind of achieve that feeling without him so, changing anything he does? Yeah. So one of the things that I, I like to work with people to have them look at is positions where actually not a lot of muscle groups are being held um, oftentimes like women on top position or various different positions where it's a bit more athletic and things are, you know, you're, you're holding your arm here and you're holding your thigh there that can feel like there's less just space to relax and actually work on some of the Kegel muscles and vaginal muscles. Mm. So looking at positions that are just a bit more restful, um, where that squeeze can really happen and that body contact can happen. So anytime you have a position where, the giving partner, the male partner is coming straight on. That's Mm going to be where, you know, there's a great opportunity for vaginal squeeze and Kegel muscle squeeze, but that might feel like the penetration is a little bit faster. It's hard to fill size. uh, It's hard to grip on when you're in a somewhat more casual position and it's less straight on penetration. So a bit more body contact, um, a bit more of an angle. Those positions can feel a little bit better for, Oh yeah, I can feel more of you. It can squeeze a little bit more. Um, it's less sort of completely open and a little bit more relaxed. You know, the butt is relaxed, the thighs are relaxed. Um, and that can feel like, oh, there you, you know, a little bit more present. There you are. I enjoy that. Um, there's a position in the book called the waterfall that I really like. I think it's actually my favorite from the book. Um, and it's the giving partner and the male partner on their side on the bed. And then the receiving partner, the female partner lying on their back, coming at their partner like a T shape, mm-hmm. bringing, bringing their butt, bringing their pussy straight up to their partner's groin at a sideways position and gently laying their legs up and over their partner's butt like a waterfall. Okay. So coming sideways and everybody's lying down. Everybody's really relaxed, but it allows the giving partner to thrust very slowly. And because the receiving partner is on their back, they have their legs up and draped over. Um, they can ground their feet down and actually get like a really good butt squeeze and a really good muscle squeeze. Mm. They can relax and just feel like really slow penetration. No one is really, you know, doing anything too athletic or working too hard. And it can be a really great position for, oh, I really feel you. I feel every inch of you. There's a lot more sensation here. And I can sort of grip on or have you deeper, or really grab your butt, hold on to your body, those kind of things. Great. Well, that's that's about all we have time for today, Elizabeth. I'm just wondering, first of all, thanks so much for coming on the show. I'm just wondering if uh, listeners would like to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way for them to do that? I would love to have them find me on my website, which is McGrathSexTherapy.com. 
Uh, that's M C G R A T H. Um, also, I have an Instagram account, which is the same. It's McGrath Sex Therapy. I love getting messages from people on there, seeing pictures that people post, uh, having requests for questions, information, things like that. I also have a Facebook page uh, by the same name, and they're welcome to contact me there. Um, and I just, I love to be in conversation with people through internet means, especially people all over the world. So it would be great to hear from you. Um, and the book, uh, The Couples Kama Sutra, is available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's also available through Target and Barnes and & Noble. Um, and I am available for contact through Amazon as well. If people buy the book and want to let me know their thoughts or suggestions, uh, write reviews or comments, I'm always so happy to get them. So That's perfect. I'll make sure to include yeah. all those links in the show notes. Um, and oh, wonderful. That's about it. Thanks again, Elizabeth. Thank you, Sean. It's a pleasure talking to you. And have fun out there, guys. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed the podcast this week with Elizabeth. And make sure to check out the show notes for all the links we discussed today. And by the way, if you want to learn my most important sex tips and techniques that will bring you and your partner back arching, spine tingling, toe curling orgasms that will keep them coming back for more, you'll find them in my discreet and private newsletter. Just go to badgirlsbible.com newsletter, enter your name and email address, and I will send these sex tips straight to your inbox.